Good afternoon, afternoon, everybody. (laughs) Sometimes I told you, sometimes I roll into it so fast that it's when I make the video up at the end to post on YouTube, I can't find a good place. You know how, how lots of times when people are on video and you like hit pause, they look bizarre. Yes. I have trouble finding non-bizarre moments (laughs) is my problem. So I'm trying to stop, look not crazy. Yes. And say hello. So anyway, we're glad y'all are here. It's a we beautiful are. day today. Um, this uh, last final Monday in March, the That's beginning right. of Holy Week, Palm Sunday yesterday. That's right. And um, this is the day Jesus turned the tables over. Wow. On Monday he goes back. To, he he goes um, back to Bethany Sunday night. On Monday he comes back and he goes to the temple and confronts the temple and turns tables over. And the key teaching point in that is that he is in that moment invoking the words and actions of Jeremiah. And you can turn later today, if you want like, to Jeremiah 7 and, and read about it. It's Jeremiah, who is the first one who says, uh, who says you've turned this temple into a den of thieves. So anyway, yep. And I know that, uh, Scott, one thing you like to uh, talk about to people about Jesus is that it's not meek and mild little Jesus jumping like little little sheep jumping over the fence. This is Jesus with righteous anger. Righteous anger. And, and on the way into town that morning on Monday, he cur- curses he, the, the, the tree. poor fig tree, right? Yes. So, be, tree didn't be, do anything I'm often wrong. asked, why is that? <laughs> What's the deal with the fig tree? It's because the fig tree was a symbol of the temple, right? Jesus understands that um, it is the temple priests who should be leading the people toward God, but is but are actually leading pe- the people away from God. Right. So they they really are the principal target of Jesus, I think, and um, uh, beyond that, the Romans. But it's really the temple priests because they should know better. Right. The leaders, the priests, the Sadducees, the 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 Pharisees, they should know better, right. and they don't. But, or but they, they won't. They do. Well, they do yeah, know. That's a question, isn't that, it? That's why they're angry yeah. with Jesus. They yeah. don't want to stop this this whole kind of scam thing they got going on. They don't want it to end. That's right. They want to stay in power. They're they're fat and happy. Yes. And rich. And, and the high the office you... <laughs> of the high priest is just sort of passed out from father and son, and a lot of corruption. And everybody knew there was a lot of corruption. Right. But anyway. Today, it's going to be an interesting tie-in because today we begin to get to the construction of the tabernacle and the plans for the tabernacle and the priests and all the rest yes. of it. I think we'll probably get that far yes. today. So yes. you can keep that in mind with in terms of Holy Week. Right. So right. notice short sleeves, first time. Short this, sleeves. This Second year, time. I haven't worn a short sleeve shirt in months, so it's a kind of a big Beautiful day. Beautiful day outside today. Yeah. Yep, yep, it is just just lovely. So, so I was just gonna mention. You probably might mention it later that people who've gone with us to Israel in the past in 2016, um, they were to Shiloh and they actually saw a pretty good model of the tabernacle. Because yeah, and people who will be with us on this trip will have the same opportunity. That, that's right, because Shiloh was where the tabernacle ends up for uh, hundreds of years. Hundreds of years, it's amazing. And if you want to read the best story around all that, read the story at, at the beginning of the book of Samuel, um, and that'll sort of give it to you. So, anyway. All righty. So, shall I? I'm guessing you shall. Open us up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful again to be gathered together in this way. We have been acknowledging it for a year that we're grateful that if we have to go through this pandemic, that we have technology like this that can bring us together so these Bible studies can can go on. And we look forward to the day, the not too distant day, when we are back together in person, um, as well as being online. And uh, we just uh, today pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us and open our hearts and our minds to you and help us really, really get grounded in some of this exodus, high priest, sacrifice, tabernacle stuff, because it is all very important to uh, our reading of the New Testament well and understanding the nature of the 
gift you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All okay, right. thank you, Patty. Okay, so I guess I'll make this comment while we're getting organized and set. You know, there's a book in the New Testament called Hebrews, and it's one of those books that tends to be very, um, if you have gold on the edges of your Bible, Hebrews oftentimes tends to be kind of glued together because it's, truth is, it's kind of weird and it's kind of strange to to most Christians um of 2021 and the reason is because the book of hebrews is completely grounded in the old testament system of temples and sacrifices and priests and in the book of hebrews jesus is the priest beyond all priests so you don't need any you don't need a priestly system anymore jesus is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices so that is all swept away but the book itself it has a few places in it that people will tend to focus on that don't have as much hmm, um, connection to the parts of the old testament they don't know but um it's it's to, if you really take a little time and i brought i brought pictures and diagrams and things today to, for us to use to try to get um, begin getting grounded in this and i i want to use this these upcoming chapters in the book of exodus to do that so that means that please don't hold back your questions it also means there, there you'll probably have questions i can't answer because I don't know every in and out of the whole Hebrew sacrificial system and priestly system. It it just but I understand it enough to to put it in the context of Jesus' sacrificial offering of himself and um, that is about good enough for me. So, okay. Where have we ended? Okay, so let's let's just go back in chapters 20, 20, 21, 22, 23, um, the people are encamped at the base of Mount Sinai and God is giving them the law. Um, they, in verse, chapter 19, they said, yeah, 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 we're down with this, we're ready, we're good, they were confirm it, yes, God, this is a two-way covenant, you have your responsibilities, we have ours, we're ready. And then in 20, 21, 22, 23, that is spelled out beginning with the ten commandments it's kind of very high high level right and then on down to this some of this case law about oxen and injuries and accidental deaths and stuff that at least kind of opened our eyes to the fact that you know it might be the ancient world but they had a lot of the same issues and disputes that had to be worked out as we did and they understood concepts of like manslaughter and negligence and murder and some of the differences between them and they wrestled with the issues of restitution and penalties and punishment and so forth but we're kind of done with that section now um chapter 23 finished with god's telling them that an angel from god is going to lead them on to the promised land and that God is going to protect them and God is going to clear the way for them. And that is a lesson that they will forget. Because when they get there, they chicken out. They let fear overcome them and they refuse to trust God and to trust God's promises. And so they turn away and God says, okay, well, that's what you want to do. Then you'll just wander in the wilderness until you all are all gone and your children and your grandchildren enter the promised land. So that's that's when they wander the 40 years. They're not really lost in the 40 years. They're just wandering because they have refused to enter the promised land and God has respected their, their decision. But uh, then later, as you know, they do under the leadership of God and Joshua. So we are at chapter 24, verse 1. Um, we talked earlier in the book of Exodus that there are probably, most scholars may, will, would agree that there are several sources being used to, you know, to, to put this book into the form that you and I have it. And so um, 
it can be a little bit it's not always neatly flowing but it's all important and it reminds us of things and i don't think the editors of this were being unnecessarily <laughs> dense they were just understood the power of repetition as the writers understood the power of repetition in an oral culture right because most of this it, it all began really as oral traditions so for chapter 24 verse 1 so God has said, the angel's going to clear the way for you. Then Yahweh said to Moses, come up to Yahweh. God is up on the mountain. You and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Now, interestingly, Joshua isn't mentioned here. And Joshua is really one of Moses' right-hand guys. So you would think he would be, but uh, probably Joshua's left with the people in the encampment um, to oversee them and keep order and, and stuff while these 73-odd fellows, 73 fellows, make their way up the, the mountain. So God says, you are to worship at a distance. The group, the big group, kind of a big group, actually, isn't it? But Moses alone is to approach Yahweh. The others must not come near and the people may not come up with him. So the people are going to stay encamped. This larger group is going to go up a certain ways, and then beyond that, Moses is going to go up. Okay? When Moses went, because he's just told all this to Moses, when Moses went down the mountain and told the people all Yahweh's words and laws, chapters 20, 21, 22, 23, they responded with one voice, Everything Yahweh has said we will do. And Moses then wrote down everything Yahweh had said. Because it's a lot, right? So the key thing here is to notice the people's agreement to this covenant. It's a treaty. It's a two-way document. It's a contract. God has responsibilities the people have responsibilities. And the overarching story of the Old Testament is the story of the people's unwillingness to live up to their end of the contract, thereby creating a terrible, terrible, wrenching pro problem for God. God's problem is he made this covenant with these people so that through them, the whole world would be rescued. The whole world would be put right with God. The whole world would live in relationship with God as God wants. And when the people of God prove unwilling to live up to their end of the covenant, what does it mean? What will happen? Will God's promises go unkept for eternity? And of course, you and I know the answer is to that is no that God himself would do it in the person of Jesus Christ, who would take on human flesh and be born in the family of Abraham and be that faithful Jew who would keep the covenant. But these affirmations of the people at this mountain that they will do it, got to see that, got to remember that. This is, this is a two-way contract, two-way covenant, and the people promise, and they will break that promise shortly, and then, the, then they will break it for century after century after century. Okay, so, to go back to verse 4, Moses then wrote down everything Yahweh had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. Now, this is going to be, to go back to a little bit of what God had told Moses, an altar where the stones are not carved and chiseled out. They're going to be careful about the steps, right? They're going to be careful about exposing themselves on this. So he's just going to go down. He's going to set up 12 stone pillars. And what do you think those pillars represent? The 
12 tribes of there Israel. There you go. Tells you right there next, right on the page. Set up 12 stone pillars representing <laughs> the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> See, I'm, you know, I, I ask such easy questions. Don't you wish all your teachers in school were like that? Yes. Oh, yeah. I would have had some really advanced <laughs> degree somewhere. <laughs> Verse 5. Then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to Yahweh. So young men go out, they collect the animals, the animals are brought, they are slaughtered, they are basically... Um, uh, Burnt, cooked, right? Barbecue time as fellowship offerings to Yahweh. Um, Moses took half of the blood of these animals and put it in bowls. And the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, which would be what Moses had written down about the law, and read it to the people. And they responded, We will do everything Yahweh has said. We will obey. So that is yet another affirmation. It's like they've signed this contract four times, I think, if I counted it correctly. Two times just in this chapter. Put there John Hancock at the bottom of the page. We will do everything Yahweh has said. We will obey. And what is supposed to flow from that is our blessing after blessing after blessing leading up to the rescue of humankind and the restoration of all of God's creation. That's what's at stake. We will do everything Yahweh has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. So this type of blood covenant, it, it, it's, it's a ritual. It's a way of emphasizing the seriousness of it, the depth of it. Blood is life. The ancient people understood that. It's why they engaged in so much blood sacrifice of animal blood, sometimes in some cultures. A lot of human blood was shed, right? But across the globe, ancient people understood that, 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 that in the blood was the life. It's like the famous line from Bram Stoker's novel, um, Dracula, when this crazed doctor is hauling, uh, you know, it's the blood, blood is the life kind of thing. You can remember, uh, I don't know if girls did this. Did girls become like blood sisters or is it only little boys who became blood brothers I patty think, i think little boys i was just remembering we saw the tv show fargo ah that's um, right which was set like in the 1920s and when they went up to shake or do whatever they were going to do one said no this time and they both slipped yeah their yeah because when when i mean I, when I, from my generation Pretty much every kid would have a blood brother at some point in their childhood. And you would go out in the back and you'd have a little pen knife and you'd make this tiny little cut, you know, and you'd, you'd, you'd rub the, the blood together, you and your blood brother, and wear rub fingers. This Fargo deal was they took the knife and basically slashed the palm of their hand. It was These a grown men did. Big blood. It was a big deal. Yeah. It was a big covenant they were making. They were both taking big risks, right? Yes. The idea being that they were sealing their promises with blood, and that made it that made it more serious, more committed, uh, more enduring than if they had just said the words. That was their idea, anyway. And and that's what's happening here. And just don't think that this is this is not anything weird to the Hebrews. This was the way of ancient people. Okay, um, um, and little kids <laughs> growing up in the 1950s when I was a little kid. Um, and one could say it is the way that God is using to drive home to these people that they have made this covenant. They cannot take it lightly. It is sealed in blood 
And of course, then it's a very easy thing to take it then to the New Testament, right? When when Jesus becomes the Paschal Lamb, because we've already had that in Exodus. Exodus, the Paschal Lamb is the Lamb whose blood is spread, who slaughtered and bread is blood was spread on the doorway of the Israelite homes in Egypt, so that the death of the firstborn would pass them by. So you take these different pieces of of animals and blood and sacrifices, you carry them forward to Jesus at the Last Supper when he says, this is my body, this is my blood, right? How serious is that? We're coming up on Monday, Thursday. This is my body, this is my blood, Jesus says. And um, it, when Jesus says that, around that meal, that Passover meal, all of these images come rushing forward to the disciples with him. They're all good observant Jews. They're all righteous Jews, meaning they, they all strive to keep the law. They all come rushing forward. Their whole history as God's people. And Jesus now offers himself to them and to the world as, as the Lamb that has been slaughtered. Monday Thursday is very, very powerful and, and often skipped over by far too many Christians. So, verse 9. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the, other, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Let's just read on a little bit. We'll talk about this. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli is a blue stone which is ground up to make blue paints and 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 blue dyes. It's 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 a beautiful color. Beautiful color. A pavement made up of lapis lazuli as bright blue as the sky. Okay, so they saw God. Under his feet was something like a pavement. So what do they what are they experiencing? Exodus will make a big deal out of short in a few chapters later out of the fact that Moses cannot see the face of God. Because Moses is why? Because Moses is unholy. Moses is sinful. And, and he can't behold the face of God, which means God's unmediated presence. Nothing between Moses and God. Moses would not survive that kind of encounter, the completely unmediated presence of God with Moses. So here, it, it can't mean that they just look up and see the face of God, the unmediated presence of God, whatever that, no. There is still a veiling here. So it's like whatever they experience, they can see something of God. For Moses, it will, later on, it will be God's back, <laughs> interestingly, because God says, well, just sink back here on the rock. You can't see my face, but I'll pass by and you can see my behind. Well, my back, which is a way of saying to Moses, I have to be veiled from you in a sense. So here, they see a veiled God of Israel, misty, looking through fog. Um, they see feet, and they see the foot of heaven, which makes sense that they would see it as blue, because when the sky is at its most beautiful, it's a rich, rich blue in this stone, the lapis lazuli, is is a deeply rich, beautiful blue. Um, and that is how they experience the mediated, veiled presence of God with them. It's a powerful thing still. They go up the mountain and, and they may not be as Moses is and as you and I are, able to 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 see this 
um, unmediated presence of God, but it's still very powerful, is it not? They right. saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement. And then there's a word saying that God has brought them there for communion, for fellowship. God does, did not raise his hand against these leaders of Israel. They saw God and they ate and they drank. In this t moment, in the, these moments, there is nothing of the thunder and the lightning and the fire that's been characterizing God on the top of Mount Sinai. They go up. They see God as much as, as much, they behold as much as they can and live. God protects them in that way. He doesn't lay a hand on them. God restrains things. God restrains them. Um, and they eat and they drink. The whole purpose is to convey to the reader this deep sense of communion and fellowship that these elders have with God at this moment. It's not something all of Israel. These are just 70 elders, plus Nadab and Abihu and Moses. That's what they are experiencing. And they put it into words as best they can. We shouldn't, be, it, we shouldn't pretend that we know in some exacting way what they're, exactly what they're experiencing, what they're hearing, and what they're seeing. No, no, that, that, we can't do that. We have what's written here, and that's enough. They saw God, and they ate, and they drank. Very powerful. Okay, any thoughts or questions over there, Patty, from anybody? Um, no, not, um, not really. Um, Sharon just put that, you know, on in her Bible, the, the notes called it Sapphire Stone. Yeah. So. Yeah, it, you know, um, if you talk to an artist, they'll know what the color is. Because for, a lo for hundreds, thousands of years, it's been made into dye and pigments and so forth. And it is a deep, deep, beautiful blue. Um, in the NIV, in the NRSV, they simply said um, <laughs> uh, a pavement made of blue which I thought was kind of weird. I, I, you know, lapis lazuli, I don't know if that's, ex it's probably just some Hebrew word term that is a little unexacting, but is meant to convey a deep, beautiful blue. So there we go. So lapis lazuli is a good choice. You do have a question from yeah. Linda Rivera. She, and Linda, you know there are no silly questions. That's right. <laughs> she wants to know, why do we go from Lord L-O-R-D, Lord, uppercase, to God in this paragraph? Well, I think it's a little bit... There are, there are big answers to that question having to do with... There are portions of Scripture where God is only referred to as Lord and there are others where God is pretty much only referred to as God, that capital G, Elohim, in the um, Hebrew. But here, it's just like if I talk with anybody else. I mean, if I talk about Patty, I will use her name sometimes in the course of the conversation, but not every time. And I think that I don't think we should make this more complicated than than that. Um, it would be uh, you could, for example, verse eleven. It could say it could say, but Yahweh did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. Um, or in here it's just God twice and it could be going back to some ancient source but that doesn't really need to concern us um, the God in view here is is Yahweh and so sometimes he's Yahweh and sometimes he's, he's God so okay anything else and it was not a silly question. Never. I mean, <laughs> there I can think of one Bible, the way it's printed, these different source documents that are, you know, 
these are scholars guesses about these things they may be informed guesses but every every one of them's got their own way to do this but you'll see a bible with maybe the sources printed in different in different colors so the elohim passages would be in color one color the yahweh passages would be another i i don't get too wrapped up in that i think the editors the writers and editors know what they're doing and and um there we go so verse 12 Yahweh said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. Because remember, the elders only went up so far. And so now it says, God, and God says to Moses, I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments I have written for their instruction. So now we get this idea that Moses is going to go all the way up to the mountain top, or close, I guess. And there he's going to get these tablets of stone on which God is going to inscribe the law. Okay? Um, the heart of the law is what? The Ten Commandments. And underneath the Ten Commandments, the deepest heart of the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 13. Then Moses sent out with Joshua his aid, and Moses. So now Joshua is in the picture, and Moses went up on the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, "Wait for us, he, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in dispute can go to them." So now Moses and Joshua are going to go up, and the rest are just going to wait. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it. And the glory of Yahweh settled on Mount Sinai. Glory is means everybody can see that it is God who is settled on Mount Sinai. Glory is a social term. Glory means everybody can see that you are who you claim to be. And this, you'll see when we get to the very end of the book of Exodus, that this language is sort of repeated as the glory of the Lord descends upon the tabernacle. And another very cool scene. So when Moses, verse 15, when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of Yahweh settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day... Yahweh called to Moses from within the cloud. Verse 17, kind of like down below, right? To the Israelites, down below, the glory of Yahweh looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. It's very dramatic. Remember the word that is that means these, these manifestations of God's presence, theophany. The the elders had experienced a theophany of God in the feet, the pavement, right? God's restraining of himself. All of that's a theophany. It's just a quiet one. This is a not quiet. This is the mountain, and now it looks like the mountain is a volcano or something, you know, erupting. Um, it has all the might and power and majesty that most people expect to find in God. You see, we Christians are weird. Let me let that sink in. We are weird. Everybody on the planet understands that God is great. Everybody understands that God is mighty and God is powerful. And nobody is surprised if you see God in the thunder and the lightning and the fire and the rest of it. Because God is the creator of the cosmos and God can do anything God wants and God is all powerful. And we Christians say yes, yes, yes to all that. And this creator of the cosmos was born to a very young woman, a teenager, in a very out-of-the-way place called Nazareth. You see? That, that is what people don't get. You know? Um, in Islam, 
they're very good at God is great. That's a, that's the phrase of Ho Akbar, is that God is great. That They're really good at that part. They're really good at the transcendence of God. What they have no understanding of, no patience for even, is this God who will take on human flesh and be born in human likeness and be weak, a child, a baby, coming out of a woman's womb. That just is to them is just like, and I, I get that because that is not really how people think about God. So, so verse 17, to the Israelites, the glory of Yahweh looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went on up the mountain and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, 40 days and 40 nights. It is a length of time that means it's not short. The noun time is usually defined as the system of those sequential <laughs> relations that any event has to any other. As past, present, or future, indefinite and continuous duration regarded as that in which events... Alexa, stop. <laughs> Okay, that is, that's like the first time that's happened, right? It, and it was really a funny time because I don't know if every... I have you on two different things. I've got you on my uh, desktop and I've got you on an iPad. But you you stopped. And, I stopped. And, and you lost, we lost you for a little yes. bit. But not everybody may have lost you. And for some reason, well, I think Alexa thought she'd pick up the slack. I, <laughs> I don't, don't know. know. I, <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, I think I mentioned the word T-I-M-E and she proceeded to tell me what it was or something. Yes. We have an echo in here. So there we go. So, 40 days and 40 nights. That's how long it's going to be there. How long did the flood last in Genesis? 40 days and 40 nights. How long was Jesus tempted in the wilderness? 40 days and 40 nights. There's a bunch of them spread throughout Scripture. And in a way, they're tied together because they're, they're usually um, uh, around some sort of wilderness experience, right? Yes. And, 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 but they really convey it's not a few days, not a short period of time, not forever, um, but pretty, pretty lengthy. You know, they're really, you know, I urge people when you come upon the 40 days and 40 nights to, to see them together, to see the connections one to the next. But don't convert everything into a calendar in your head, because I think that 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 gets in the way of this. So. All right. So Scott, now. Yes. OK, so I, w I was thinking of something as we were going through this. And again, we'd have to go back to Genesis and. I know one of the things that you really, really love in Genesis is the um, verse where it says, "And God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the wild, uh, cool of the evening," which is like, wow. This verse, where it says, um, "Oh my goodness, I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments that I have written for their instruction." That to me is also such a personal thing that God didn't just say these things and want to take the chance that, yeah, Moses was going to get all this right. This is something that he is saying that he has written in his own hand. And that is so It is personal. deeply personal. It yeah. is this piece of the Bible that runs from the beginning, the very opening of Genesis, before the fall, all the way through this deeply personal nature of God. And that's why we can't ever let go of that. Like I said, it's easy to know that God is great and and all that stuff. But to know that God is, is deeply personal, that that's what God wants to from us, a deeply personal relationship. That's what it means when it says God so loved the world. It's not an idea. It's not a sentiment. It's deeply personal. It's it's in action, and God gave His own Son for the world. So, yeah, Patty, that's a really that's a really good observation. God inscribing these things with His own hand. Um, it's 
This is a big rescue project that God is launching with these people. It's important. It is about it is about God's God's children, God's humanity, God's creation that God loves and cares for and is desiring to rescue. Um so All right, anything else? Okay, chapter 25. All right, continuing right onward. Now Moses is up on the mountain, right? So there are two, we're going to have to get in the helicopter now and then in this. There are basically two things that God is getting. I mean, that Moses is getting from God at Mount Sinai. One, we've had exposure to already. The people get the law. And law giving will become part of what you find in not only in Exodus, but in Leviticus and Numbers. And it's all restated again in Deuteronomy with some additions and stuff. That, that's why the first five books are called the Torah, the books of the law, because they're so law filled. But that is not the only thing that happens at Mount Sinai. In addition, God gives the people the blueprints and instructions for building a home. For whom? For God. For God to live with them, to dwell with them, to be with them, to be in their presence constantly in a way that God is not elsewhere. So he's going to tell them how to build a home. Now, these are nomadic people. They are going to move around, and they're going to move around for a long time. Abraham, the rest of them, they're nomadic because they follow the herds and all the rest of it. They need to get the sheep fed and all that stuff. So this home that God is going to have them build for him, for God's self, is going to have to be a tent. They're going to have to be able to strike it down, carry it, move it on, raise it up, just like a circus, just like the circus tents of old. I was just thinking like a circus. Yeah, just like the circus tents. Yeah, they're going to have to be able to strike it down, pick it up, pack it, move it on, then and then erect it again. So that's what's needed, and that is what God is going to give them. And because it is God's home, It is going to be a holy place. It is going to be a sanctuary, right? Which comes from the word holy, as in sanctify, sanctuary. And in it will be God's own special, special, special place. The holiest of holies where the Israelites will go in and meet with God. Sort of like going in and when I was in my middle teen years, my grandfather lived with us. And when he came to live with us, he built an addition onto our house. And you would have to leave our leave the house, just step through a tiny car, carport, um, kind of a breezeway, shortest breezeway ever, and knock on a door, and then, you know, Grandpa would tell you to come in, and so then you'd go in and see Granddad. So so that's kind of what the Holy of Holies is. It's, it's the actual room in the structure that is actually going to be God's special place. So all of that is going to be given to how they, how they are to do all this, recognizing that they're building a home for God is what is given in these upcoming chapters in Exodus. And they do get repetitive, and we will deal with that. Um, But we want to spend enough time in some of this to really get a sense of it. And I have lots of diagrams and lots of pictures to share today. Okay, so just look at 25. Yahweh said to Moses, quote, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. Look at this next verse. Look at this next verse. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. Mm. 
If you don't want to give it to God, God doesn't want it. If you don't want to give it to God, God doesn't want it. God doesn't... <laughs> I just, I did it again. I flashed to the movie Ghost with Whoopi Goldberg. When she's going to go down is, what was her name in that movie, honey? Oh, Mabel Lee Brown? Something, something like, like that. Yes. Rita Faye Brown or something. <laughs> and she's going to go to the bank and get some check. And she walks out of the bank. And she's got a check for $4 million. And she and the ghost guy, whatever his name was, tells her to go give to the nuns. She finally decides to do it. And she has, starts to give to the nuns. And the nun has hold of one end. Whoopi has hold of the other. And it's like this tug of war. She doesn't want to really give it up. It's a $4 million check. Well, Adam May Brown. God is only going <laughs> to tug on that money for so long. If you, if you don't want to give it, if you if you if you resent the offering you make to God in 2020, if you resent what you the offering you give to God, that if you give to the church, then don't give it. God will find a way. It's just so striking to me that in Exodus chapter 25, verse 2, from eons ago, God says, You are to receive the offerings for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. It's kind of cool, isn't it, Patty? It is. It is. It really is. Kind of surprising in a way, isn't it? What You know, what, what it does... This simple verse, it begins to educate us. Not begins. It continues the education that began in Genesis about who God really is. About who God really is. And I think also about giving us free will for him to make everybody give. The, it's almost like making you love God. This is like... Which you can't, is, which even God can't make somebody can't love him because then it's so, not love, so this right? This seems more like, yeah, you, you, this is really something that you have to think about and want you know, to do yourself because you feel you just need to right want, you need to want to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there we go. Here's what. Here's what. Now, the offerings are going to be the materials needed to make the stuff for needed to build the sanctuary, the the um, tabernacle, the home for God. Those are all synonyms. And to build and to make some clothing for the priests who will be in there to serve God. Okay. So verse 3, these are the offerings you are to receive from them. We need gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and another type of durable leather. All of this is tough on the translators, which I'm just telling you. Acacia wood, olive oil for the light. My house needs a light. Your house needs a light. God's house is going to need a light. Spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. Patty, Patty burns candles in our house. She kind of likes the fragrance of them, right, dear? Oh, I sure do. There we go. God likes it in his house. And onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breast piece. Now, the ephod and breast piece, I have a photo I'll show you in just a little bit, um, are part of the priestly vestments. Vestments is a word we use now to talk about priestly stuff. It's, it's just these things that signify them as the priests as being those who are dedicated to this special service of God, to the caring for the tabernacle, to the carrying out of the priestly rituals, and so forth. The entire priestly system functions as a way for this holy God to live with an unholy people. That's what the priestly system is there to do. It's like the priestly system is the is the mediator. The priestly system is is what enables this. The priestly system is the mist or the fog or whatever you want to talk about it that enables the people, this unholy 
sinful people, as we are, to live with God. So, verse 8. Then God says, have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. The sanctuary, there are different words used to talk about it. Sometimes words that have the holy idea embedded in them. Sometimes the word is simply a dwelling, like a house would be for you and me. Have them make a sanctuary for me, a holy place, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Isn't that fascinating? God's going to give them the blueprints, the instruction sheet, and they are the, going to be the ones who put it together, of course. Now, what is the... There, there is a simple teaching lesson in this that runs throughout the Bible. I mean, could not God, the creator of the cosmos, pop this tabernacle into existence and say, hey, just go outside and look. I put it, It's there. It's there for you, buddy. It's there. No. I mean, well, God could do that. But God doesn't do that. God chooses to work through us. God chooses to work through, through other creatures at times. God works through angels who are spiritual creatures. God works through us. God is not a God of the magic wand. It, I think it frustrates people sometimes. They wish God would just do it, but they don't see that a genuine relationship is grounded on the full participation of both people. Just think about your own life. I guarantee you that the that the the very best relationships in your life are relationships where both parties, both people, are full participants and both contribute to it and both work toward it. It doesn't just one isn't just waiting on the other to do everything. So, I have pictures. Don't you like that, Patty? I love pictures. Sure, we all love pictures. <laughs> so let because you, you, I want you to see this stuff before we go any further in reading about it. Okay, so this is the tabernacle structure. This is a very typical drawing. Um, you can see that there is an outer fence that demarcates God's place. Only the priests of Israel went inside that outer fence. Inside, there are tables set up for the slaughtering of the animals. There are altars and <laughs> barbecues. I think that's basically what a labor is. And, a, a, and both, brazen means these are both set up for barbecuing. They're, they're cooking pits. Okay, because that's going to be a lot of what happens inside this tabernacle. I remember um, a few years back, I picked up um, Paula Fredrickson's book on the Gospel of John, and she paints this very dramatic picture of Jerusalem during Jesus' day. And the, tab and the temple, I'll explain that, the temple at Passover, and how it was just a charnel house, she said, just because animals are just being slaughtered and and cooked and just just smoke is rising. The whole city smells of it. It's a very dramatic um, telling of this. And, you know, I think it would have been something like that. So the temple structure itself is that dark structure in the back. Okay. <clears throat> What's important to know is that when these people, the Israelites, settle in, in a land after some centuries, God tells them to build a permanent structure for God. And all they're basically told to do is to take this tabernacle and convert it to marble and stone. And that's what it is. That's what basically happens. 
is that this this basic idea is converted into marble and stone, and so it becomes a permanent temple. But for now, we are nomads. So we have this. Here's a close-up of some of the furnishings that we're going to hear about. There's an outer veil, which is just nothing more than an outer door, really, uh, except it's easy to fold, take somewhere. Um, various curtains and coverings we'll talk about um, a little bit. The altar of incense to make the place smell better. A table where bread is placed on all the time we'll talk about in a little bit. An inner veil, an inner curtain behind which is kept the Ark of the Covenant, which we'll keep, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it has, it like anybody's dwelling, there's food, there's light, <laughs> it smells good, I guess. Um, there you go. That's what the tabernacle is. You will really help your understanding of, Bible, of the Bible if you grasp that this is God's home with his people. God is present with them in a way that God is not present with other people. There is a dramatic vision in the book of Ezekiel when everything is falling apart and the people have abandoned God for centuries and the Babylonians are poised to come sweeping in and the presence of God is seen to rise from the temple and head off to the east to Babylonia. Meaning what? Wow, that God's no longer in the house. And so the Babylonians then come and destroy it, which they do in 586. Of course they can destroy it. Why can they destroy it? Because God's, it's not God's house anymore. God left. God left. So, okay. So, <clears throat> this is to give you a sense of the size of it. It's not enormous. This is a football field. The outer fence, you know, is nearly half as wide as a football field and what, maybe 25 yards long, something like that. We're converting cubits to us, you know, in, to, to our distances and so forth and doing all of this. But it gives you some idea about the size of the tabernacle. At one time, somebody erected out in the wilderness south of Jerusalem a tabernacle model, full size, right there in the desert. Okay, so I see Sharon's asking about the dimensions. We'll get more about the dimensions here in a bit. Um, and it's in cubits. Just for your information, a cubit is basically a foot and a half. So, we think. So, anyway, so there it is. You can see the outer fence. You can see the entrance gate in black, right? The entrance um, curtain in black. You can see the couple of uh, big... Um, <laughs> I'm really not being sacrilegious when I call them barbecue bits. It's just us trying to drive home what's happening in this place. And then you can see the tabernacle proper, the holy home of God proper there um, uh, under the tent. And this is another view of it. You can see the altar and the labor. And you can see the tabernacle itself. There's a close-up of the front of the tabernacle. And that's kind of what it would look like because yes. I think it's just most of these are desert people. These are nomads. And they're putting this thing up and taking it down and this is the ephod. It's part of the priestly vestments. We'll see in a minute that there are 12 stones. And those 12 stones represent, what do you think? The 12 tribes. There you go. <laughs> There's a lot of 12s in the Bible. They all come. Why does Jesus have 12 disciples? Same reason. Same reason. He's forming around himself a new Israel. Right? And so he has 12 disciples. Not 11 not 13. When one is gone, they have to replace him. When, when Judas is gone, they replace him with, with Messiah, Matthias, Acts 1. Okay, so let's see what other things I have here. Now, see, it's just slightly hokey, but that 
if you look at other drawings of the priestly vestments, it looks something like that. And of course, why would he have on himself the high priest an ephod with 12 stones, one for each tribe of Israel? Who is he, basically, when he goes in to see God? He's the representative. Yeah, he, he is. He, he is Israel. He is the 12 tribes. Yep. Um, there is the um, table of the, uh, the bread of the presence, it's sometimes called. The show bread, it's sometimes called. This is bread. This is a table with bread on it that would be kept there. And um, in the tabernacle and it would be replaced regularly but once it started to get a little bit old i guess i forget i don't think it was daily every every few days the priests would consume it uh, um but it's god's bread this is god's house so it needs furnishings you may say to yourself well it's god it doesn't need any of that God doesn't have a body. Isn't come on, Scott? It's not like he's in there walking around and all that stuff. So what is it with this place? I think it is a way for God to communicate to the people in a concrete way that He is with them. Let much later, God will take on human flesh, right? that will communicate to the people that God is with them. But even here, 1,500 years before Jesus, God is giving them instructions for building God a home, and it makes it very concrete, and it makes it very, very real. Um, we all communicate with others. If you're a good communicator, you communicate as you need to for the person you're talking to. I talk differently with a four-year-old than I do with you most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, because cause sometimes I meet some really bright four-year-old. But yeah, so we all do that. Of course we do. Um, and we, we use lots of ways. Imagine that we, imagine we, you walk up tomorrow morning and all of a sudden, for some bizarre reason, Ben Franklin was in your house and he started asking you questions. Well, Talk about a task to try to communicate to the nature of this world and how things work and the rest of it. It would be, you'd really have to work hard at it. Well, God works hard to communicate with us. God is God. We are not. God wants a real, genuine relationship with each of us. I, I, I know the word relationship is overused, and I'll have to come up with another one at some point. But that's what God wants. God wants us to love him because God loves us. And that has to be real and genuine and concrete. And so, yes, God's going to have a real home with these people. And they're going to be able to see it. And they're going to be able to smell bread baking for God. Okay? So. So, Scott, I do have, um, I have a question or a point yeah. to make. And I wanted to see if I'm thinking on the right way. Um, back in verse 3 uh, of 25, we're, we're talking to people that are slaves, that have just come out of slavery in Egypt, and God is asking Moses to tell the people if they want to give, they can, and of course he would like them to, but the list is not people who are slaves. It's gold, silver, bronze, all these very um, expensive uh, royal colors of thread and yarn, which we know they're the most expensive to make. So I started thinking, okay, what was God thinking? Maybe. And <laughs> I don't profess to know. <laughs> but I was wondering if maybe this was why when the Egyptians were leaving at the when last the, plague. The, when the Israelites were leaving. At the last plague, Moses told them, to ask the Egyptians for all their gold, all and their silver really good and stuff, finery, and it says that like God, God kind of softened their hearts, and the Egyptians just gave it to them. So, it was this God's plan sure. all along? Sure. This is how they would have sure. it. Sure. This is how they would have it. Okay. okay. You wonder, well, why did God want them to charge off into the Sinai wilderness, burdened down by all that useless stuff? Because it's not useless stuff. Yeah. 
because they're going to use it to build a sanctuary. Sure, that's my reading of it, I think. Okay. You know? Okay. Because yeah. first, for a few minutes, I was like, who's going to come up with this? These are slaves. They don't have much wealth. And if that's all you really did have, you were so, you know, well, obviously, there might have been a few rich people, but I don't think so. Pretty much it was Well, there was that Edmund go. G. Robinson. Oh, yes. Yes, but. he was rich. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly the way to see this. And so, and even though the people were given all this kind of finery from the Egyptians, they're going to be ones who aren't going to want to give it up, like Edmund G. Robinson. If you've seen the movie, as I'm sure you have. So, so yeah, that's exactly that's what it is. How, otherwise, how would they have all of this, right? Good question. Right. Because some of it is natural to their lives. Having ram skins and goat hair and stuff like that. But, but the expensive yarns and the gold, gold and the silver. silver and bronze and all that stuff. Onyx stones. Okay. So, let's see. I think we need to stop here. The reason is because... The next topic we're going to come to is the Ark of the Covenant. And that is not something I want to try to do in eight or ten minutes. Because um, I got pictures and we need to talk about it. Because I want to talk about what it is and what it looks like and what it means. And how it's used and misused a little bit in the history of Israel. Because it becomes such a focal point uh, of it. Um, to where even today it is featured in movies. So I think we will probably call it a day there. Unless people, any questions or anything you'd be want to type in, I can see them over here, Patty, gotcha. in my screen, my little comment window. So um, anyway, okay, there we are. We're there we are. We're back. So we'll pick a right up there at verse 10 next week. We'll talk about the Ark of the Covenant. We'll begin to talk about the furnishings. And we'll use we'll keep going back and forth between the text and some of the diagrams. And I think when we're done, we'll have a pretty good, it'll kind of sink in a little bit to us. What's you know, what's going on? And I may bring a couple other tabernacle stories, like the time David and his men wanted something to eat. And they mm -hmm. said, Well, can't we eat the bread? In the tabernacle, basically what they wanted. Yes. And Jesus refers to that story. So maybe we'll do that. We'll see. I don't want to bore people. I think you'll just take it where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's already running through my mind here. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. I better make notes after this is over so you remember. <laughs> You're probably right. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for joining with us today on this incredibly beautiful day today. I think it's supposed to be lovely today and tomorrow, and then it's supposed to start getting a little colder. Is uh, it? Yeah. Well, I mean, in the 60s, we're, we were blessed. Cold in the sense of yes. April, not yes. like we just went through a month ago, huh? Yes, yes. So <laughs> we are, we're blessed to have this beautiful weather today, and um, if you all would just join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day that you've provided us today. And we pray, God, again, just a big thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather like this together. And Lord, we do long for the day that it will be in person. And we can kind of see it, that it's kind of coming. And we're very excited about all of that, Lord. We continue to pray for our great country and we thank you, God, right now for the vaccine and for it being opened right now for so many people who were perhaps still waiting to get the shot, younger people. Um, and we pray that everybody, Lord, who wants the shot will get that shot and will get it quickly. We pray, God, for our nation. We have a lot going on right now, Lord, and I just pray uh, today was the opening arguments, and I just pray for peace in our country regarding the George Floyd tri trial. Um, we know that's going to be a very, very difficult time for many people on both sides of the aisle, both sides of, of that trial. And we just pray for calm and peacefulness to be the way that our country behaves through all of this, Lord. We continue to pray for the victims of Boulder and the Atlanta shootings 
and we pray God for you just to please soften soften people's hearts who have an intention of doing harm we pray for that Lord that you would keep us healthy and safe and well we thank you God so much for loving us for allowing us to feel your presence within us all the time God all we need to do is stop listen or ask and we are so grateful for that Lord we lift up all these prayers today. We pray them all in the name of your risen son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 And tomorrow we'll be Thanks, friends. on the air at noon. James, tomorrow, the section from James is kind of ripped from the headlines. American 2020, we might call it. Wow. Yeah, it is. Wow. So anyway, adios, everybody. Enjoy the rest Bye, of everybody. your day. Have a good Bye -bye. one. Bye-bye.